Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Kyriakos, for uh, for inviting me. Thank you, Seth. Uh, I'm I'm really honored to be here. This is uh, definitely the biggest talk I'm giving since since COVID. I uh, hear that it's also one of the first in-person talks. So I'm I'm feeling a little bit of heat. I'm feeling a little bit of pressure, but that's okay. Just just bear with me. Um, what I want to talk about uh, today is resilience of autonomous systems. Why I think it's important, why I think it's something that uh, we need to work on, and why I think it contributes to the current state of the art. So um, to, to set the scene, let me play a video. It hopefully will have sound, and it will be around two minutes in length, and it's going to kind of give a motivation of, uh, of what I'll be speaking about. Declare an emergency. Sick Night Zulu, declare an emergency. Sick Night Zulu, declare an emergency. Sick Night Zulu, Roger. You want to come in for runway 20? Hello, oh, no, could get there. Sick Night Zulu. Sick Night Zulu, say again? How could we get there? We're, uh, we just lost our engine power. Something happened. Sick Night Zulu, Roger. Wind is 23010. You're clear to land any runway at Santa Fe. Altimeter 3020. Can you give me some information? Okay, I'm six months about south. I've got a big vibration going on. My boss is going bad here, and I don't know what's going on. And I've been at 8,500. I don't think I can clear. I don't think I can get to the runway. Okay, make straight in for runway two if you can, but the wind is going to be a tailwind. Two three zero one zero. You can have any runway you want. Clear to land. I don't know what's happened here. I have no oil pressure. I have no oil pressure. Head on the final for runway two. You're seven miles from the airport. But I don't think I get. I'm not going to make it. So. Uh, um, uh, let's see. Where's the best place to go? I'm going to try to stay away from that ravine. Um, freeway? I-25 is uh, in your vicinity. And maybe the frontage road off of I-25? There's 3025. 3025. I'm just not going to make that. I'm not going to make it. We're 68 Zulu. And can you tell me what's going on now? I'm going to try to land on the freeway here if I can. I lost the engine, and I'll uh, do the best I can here. I um, don't know if I should try to land on the freeway here or on the frontage road. Front I think I'll take the frontage road. That'll be a good idea if you can. The Santa Fe winds are 240 at Niner. These, these last few seconds were just to reassure you that no one died in the making of this video. This, this is an actual video from, from air traffic at Santa Fe. And, and just to kind of preemptively reassure, reassure you, I'm going to have a few more videos of also bad looking things and no one died in any of those either. Um, okay, so, so let's kind of uh, try to unpack what, uh, what happened in this video. So something went wrong with the aircraft. The pilot is not entirely sure what went wrong, and even the, the faults kind of seem to be progressing. At first, he's like, I'm kind of losing my engine, and then at some point, he's like, I have a big vibration, and he's like, oh, I have no engine anymore. It's not really clear what's going on. He is unsure whether he can land at Santa Fe. At first, the air traffic controller is kind of trying to guide him towards Santa Fe, and at some point he says, I don't think I'm going to make it. He chooses an alternative site to land, uh, which ended up being the frontage road up the highway, and, and he manages to then land safely. Now, how is this, uh, this whole setup, if we wanted to automate what happened here, how is this different from uh, the kind of classical methods of, of robust and adaptive control? So the story in adaptive control and robust control, and I, I don't want it to seem like I'm not, uh, not paying my due respect to, to those fields. They're, they're certainly valuable, and I'll, I'll use some of the results that they have to kind of compare against, uh, against what we have. So, but the big thing in adaptive and robust control is, hey, something went wrong. We lost some of the actuators. There's some physical damage, something. We will try to reach the objective, the original objective still, 
under some lack of knowledge of the dynamics or change in knowledge of the dynamics or whatever it is. The thing is, that's quite possibly impossible. No god of adaptive or robust control is going to make you be able to land in Los Angeles if you lose both of your engines over Nashville. It's not going to happen. So what really happens and what happened here is that when something goes wrong, your original objective might not be reachable anymore. You simply might not have the capability to reach this objective. And that's, that's what happened here. The pilot was unsure. No one says that maybe he could have reached Santa Fe, but he certainly wasn't guaranteed to reach it. So what happened is the, the pilot kind of looked around, said, hey, I believe that these are the spots that I am guaranteed to be able to reach. Chose the best one of them, which was this frontage road, and then figured out how to get there and, and eventually landed safely. And so this story of resilience to bad things happening and potentially trying to figure out the new objective that you can, or the closest objective that you can reach, that kind of goes across domains. So for, for the non-aerospace folks out there, and uh, I certainly don't think of myself as, a, as an orthodox aerospace person, there's a, there's, a, there's a lot of stories to be told here, whether it's with kind of multi-agent networked control, whether it's with systems of UAVs, whether it's with uh, straight up robotics where some of your actuators fail. This is a, this is a picture from a, related to, to, a, to a recent grant that we started with, uh, with NASA. The point in all of these pictures, in all of these stories is disasters, bad things, malfunctions, physical damage, hostile action will unavoidably happen. They will eventually happen, things will go wrong. The first question you might then ask is, okay, when this disaster strikes, can the system be driven to certifiably complete its mission? And this is a question that uh, is at least partially answered by adaptive or robust control. The, the certifiable part is kind of iffy, but that is the question that certainly is, is partially answered. The second question is, can we design the system to be able to certifiably complete any mission after any disaster. So we would, we would love that. If we were able to say, hey, before even a disaster happens, I can guarantee that no matter what happens, I will be able to complete my original mission. That's great, that's probably unlikely. The third question then, maybe more realistic, is when a disaster strikes, can I immediately, online, at that point, figure out what missions the system is provably able to complete. And I, I want to emphasize this provably. Given my current imperfect, incomplete knowledge of the system dynamics, can I provably, can I, can I guarantee that I can complete a particular task? And to introduce a, a mathematical framework of what I'll be talking about, so generally I will be focused on uh, standard uh, continuous time continuous space control systems, so x dot equals f of x u, where x is the system state, u is the system input, and u lies in some set of permitted controls u. Now, bad things that could happen to this system, and there's, there's many of them and there's combinations of these, but I'll, I'll kind of be talking about three of them as a part of my talk. The first one is uh, there could be physical damage. Physical damage will possibly change the system dynamics. The second thing is uh, partial loss of control. That's something that we saw in this video. So there could be adversarial takeover, some sort of actuation failure, something like that. The third thing is actuator degradation. I used to be able to put a certain amount of thrust. I no longer have this capability. So, so my set of values that I can plug in changed. With those three things, I, I get a new system, which is x dot equals some f hat x u v, where u is now the controller that I still have uh, authority over. V is the part of the original controls that I no longer have authority over. And this u v now needs to live in some set u hat. And u hat is this, is this set of smaller or reduced actuator capability. So, 
I'll be talking about these three, and I'll start from the right to left. Uh, in my mind, at least intuitively, it seems like these should go from easier to harder problems. So let me start with the first one, that's actuator degradation. And th this is a, a real problem. I found a picture online uh, on, a, on a boating forum where the person said, okay, the, the rudder on my sailboat kind of sustained some physical damage. It was bent backwards. And so I can still move it, I think, to, to the left as much as I want. I can't really do much to the right. And so everything that I was capable of, I'm still capable of, is just that it's, it's a smaller set of inputs that I can put in. So the question now is, okay, given this, uh, this actuator degradation, so I still have the original dynamics, it's just that U is now U hat, what can I say about my certifiable capabilities? What can I say about what the system can reach? And I'm, I'm just talking about reachability, of course, one could talk about reach avoid, uh, more complicated tasks, all of that. In theory, th this question is not too hard. Uh, the dynamics are fully known. And even if the degraded actuator limits are not fully known, the reachable set, the new reachable set can be under approximated by just computing the reachable set with the under approximated limits of the actuator. In practice, the reachable set of an even fully known nonlinear system is not really computable, definitely not computable in real time. Even meaningful under approximations, and we want under approximations because we want certifiability, they're difficult. So what kind of happens in practice is uh, this, these computations of operational envelope, which is something that is done during the design phase of a system, it take weeks and can take months, it's through extensive testing, computations, we kind of figure out some subset of what the vehicle is capable of doing, and, and we say, okay, this is the operational level. Now, we know, hence, the reachable set for the nominal system. We spent months figuring it out, figuring out this operational envelope. We know a bound on the degradation. So our computation of the degraded reachable set did not start from scratch. I have no hope that after something goes bad in the middle of my mission, I will be able to recompute this new reachable set from scratch. That's not going to happen. Uh, so the, um, we, we stopped here and we said, hey, our degraded reachable set, we shouldn't compute it from scratch. And we have an idea, at least nominally, how to compute this new reachable set. It, the idea is, hey, if I'm able to reach a particular state using the old nominal control, if I can find a control that's fairly similar to the nominal one, that's within epsilon, whatever epsilon means, of the nominal control, then the new reachable, the new reachable state should not, so should not be further than some ball of size h of that epsilon away from the original, from the original thing I reach. So okay, the, the question is how do I determine this ball? How do I, uh, how do I quantify this? Ah, yes, okay, perfect, double, double. thank you. Okay. So this looks uh, like some version of Gronwald's lemma. Gronwald's lemma is kind of a standard tool that says, hey, I have the original dynamics, now I have slightly changed dynamics, what can I say about the kind of divergence of trajectories? We can do better than that, uh, and a way to do better than that is um, by imposing some, some other assumptions on the growth of these dynamics. And it's that if the right-hand side is somehow bounded by a particular function, then we can have a bound on this divergence that's better or that generalizes the, the Gronwald's lemma, called Bihari inequality. Won't spend too much time on it. Um, the point is the result kind of depends on the wildness of the system dynamics. If I have a control that's really similar to the nominal one and the dynamics are not too wild, then the new reachable state will not be too far away from the original reachable state. As in similar proofs derived from the Gronwald lemma, we kind of find the difference between the two dynamics, and then we bound it by itself from the left uh, 
I have this difference, and then from the right, I bound it by, again, a function of that difference. We can use Lipschitz if needed, and then it reduces to Gronwald's lemma, but we can do better. The point is we can do better if more information is available. Now, okay, so, so I have this idea that if the Hausdorff distance of the nominal control set and the new control set, or the degraded set, is bounded by M, then for each nominal control signal, I can find a new control signal that's within the M ball of the original control signal. And then each state in the nominal reachable set maps to a state in the degraded set within some H of M ball. What that means kind of pictorially is, and in this case my ball is a rectangle because I can do different things in different coordinates, but if my original reachable set is gray, then I know that around every gray point, in a rectangle around every gray point, there is going to be a red point. Red point is the off nominal reachable set. I still have a bit of an issue, which is, uh, I know that there's a bunch of these red points, but how do I know that everything kind of in between these red points is actually reachable? How do I know that this reachable set is not just kind of disconnected? And, and to do that, we, we use another kind of geometric trick, which is any state, we, we go backwards. Now, any state in the boundary of the new reachable set is also close to a state in the boundary of the old reachable set. So it's not just that the sets are similar. It's not just that in one direction I have this bound. I have it in the other direction. And indeed, I can see that the entire red thing is... Um, is a conservative approximation of the new reachable set. This turns out to be pretty useful. So this is an example of uh, Norbin's ship dynamics. It's, a, it's an easy ship dynamics model, and we can see that the nominal set is in, uh, is in blue. The real off-nominal degraded reachable set is in red. Our inner approximation of it is, of course, conservative, but not that bad. It's pretty decent. And, uh, in particular, we have an example here, which is uh, there's a boat, and the boat is trying to pass close to the danger zone, which is in blue, but not enter the danger zone. At some point, the boat suffers damage here. At that point, we want to figure out whether there's something in this new reachable set that allows us to pass next to the bad set, or if I'm just or if I can't guarantee that I will be able to avoid the bad set and I need to jump off the boat or stop or whatever. It turns out that we figure out that there is something in the new reachable set that avoids the bad set, and we can proceed finding the, the appropriate control. Okay, so this was the first story, actuator degradation. Let me move to the second story, partial loss of control, so adversarial takeover. And I, I have a, a video of that as well. Again, I guarantee no one died. You might find that impossible, but still. Left to right, the Stealth F-117, ladies and gentlemen. The pilot jumped out eventually, that was, of course, if, if they stayed in, a, it wouldn't be pleasant. Um, what we saw here is, if you, if you looked at the kind of the last second, last few seconds of this, let me show it on both, you see that there is a, it's really difficult to control two at the same time. You can see that there is a, uh, a bit of an oscillation on the back right of the plane, and that's a part that's called an elevon, that's a legitimate control surface. It's just that it started, for whatever reason, putting its own inputs that weren't commanded by the pilot, and the pilot couldn't counteract them or didn't know how to counteract them, and, and it ended up in a crash. So that's exactly the story that we have here. There is a system input that is uncontrolled, and that's not a disturbance. It's not a little wind or something like that. It is possibly an adversarial bad input. Uh, and there's a two-player game here. Player one, which is the controller, what remains of it, wants to reach a particular state. Player two, which is the adversary environment, whatever you want to call it, 
wishes to obstruct P1, player one. The players play simultaneously, possibly with some odd coupling between them. The question is, can player one win? Sub questions are, can player one win for any state uh, or any goal state, any starting state? Can player one win if there's some sort of a time limit? If they need to reach the state within 10 minutes, things like that. It's not too hard to develop some intuition for that. So player one intuitively can win for reaching every state if it can kind of cancel out the bad inputs, if it can cancel out the adversarial inputs and still has a little bit of control on its own that allows it to steer somehow and that potentially fights the drift if there is if there's any drift. Now, in, in linear affine systems, the answer to this is kind of clear because if you have bounded inputs and if there's a drift, eventually the drift becomes too big and, and things don't work out. But we can still ask the questions of, hey, in bounded state spaces, bounded sets of states to reach, fighting the drift might be possible. And in all cases, the available input, we have this intuition that the available input needs to be stronger than the adversary. So if the original system dynamics are x dot equals ax plus b bar u bar, loss of control over several actuators means that the system shifts to x dot is now ax plus bu plus cv, where v is the bad part, v is the part I can't control anymore, and b, uh, sorry, u is the part that I still can control. The notion of available input stronger than the adversary is that for whatever V is put in, there exists a U such that I can cancel it out, such that zero equals BU plus CV. And I said I need, I need a bit more than that, so I need that zero is kind of in the interior of this set. Now, of course, this is under certain assumptions, and you can ask whether this is necessary or sufficient, and it kind of depends on, on, on the framework. But uh, let's say that we have figured out that the system is resilient to the loss of authority. The second question we can ask is, how resilient is this system? So uh, I'm asking this question in the sense of, hey, let's say that I'm able to reach a particular state within two minutes. And now something bad happens. And I'm still able to reach that same state, but now it takes me 10 hours. Right, I'm still resilient in theory. I can still reach it. In practice, it's probably not going to work out for me. So what I want is somehow compare the nominal reach time, the nominal optimal reach time that I could have gotten before the damage to the worst case optimal reach time after the damage. Worst case being whatever the adversary throws at me. And so we, we define this, uh, this quotient in this case, we have soup inf, which is, uh, the, the interpretation is the adversary first chooses an input, or the adversary chooses an input such that whatever the controller chooses, this reach time will be large. You could ask similar questions and you could ask, hey, should we have inf soup here? Should there be some sort of causality? This is mathematically the easiest thing and kind of intuitively the easiest thing. I'm not saying that other questions are not equally important. This resilience quotient is a number between zero and one. If it's zero, that means there is no resilience. I can't reach the new state. If it's one, that means that my, uh, I didn't lose anything by losing actuators. So, so this is kind of cool. I have this number between zero and one that says, how resilient are you? Now, it turns out that uh, for driftless systems, Computing this quotient is not too hard. In general, it's kind of three partially nested optimal control problems. For driftless systems, a lot of things, and for integrators, a lot of things kind of become geometric. Optimal control turns into optimization, and we can have these weird geometric pictures that allow us to figure out the quantitative resilience. And this is something that, uh, that we call the minimax maximax quotient theorem. It's like a 20 page proof, but it works. You can do it. Now, for general linear systems, even, even just for linear systems, optimal control signals, we know they're bang, bang. They're impossible to analytically determine. The set of velocities that I can go in at 
any point depends on where I am. And so it's not very likely that I will be able to figure out the exact quantitative resilience. What our idea is, is to get some sort of bounds, get a lower bound on the nominal optimal reach time through Lyapunov theory. So a lower bound on V dot of XT. Get an upper bound on the optimal, on the nominal optimal reach time. Get a lower bound on the worst case optimal reach time. Get an upper bound on the worst case optimal reach time. Combine those four and get some sort of lower and upper bounds for quantitative resilience. And it's not going to give us an exact answer, but it's going to tell us something like, hey, I know that if a damage, if, if, if a damage happens, you won't waste more than twice the amount of time that it would have taken you otherwise. And you could be satisfied with that or not, but it's something. And so the, the first thing that, of course, we decided to apply it to is uh, elevons in fighter jets. We didn't find the model of F-117. This is an imaginary fighter jet developed um, by Swedish researchers. And we tried to see whether the system is resilient to the loss of these control surfaces. It turns out that it's resilient to the loss of one of control surfaces, but it is not resilient to the loss of the right elevon. So in other words, in our kind of uh, idealized model, indeed the, the pilot could not have done anything. The, the system was simply not resilient to this, to this loss. There's other applications. We were doing some stuff with uh, spacecraft, attitude control, uh, some things with opinion dynamics. How can you still control people's opinions if you lose power over some of the media. Of course, this is you know, something that dictators would be very interested in. Uh, altogether, we're very interested in, uh, in this kind of work. So let me go now for the, for the, third, the third part of this uh, talk, which is uh, the hardest, at least nominally, change in dynamics. Bad thing happens, my dynamics change. So in such a case, I have x dot equals f of x u. f is now new. It's not the old F, it's unknown. And uh, it's not a disturbance, again. If I lose physically a part of my airplane or a part of the vehicle, the dynamics will structurally change. It is not a disturbance. It's not one parameter or a finite number of parameters that will change. It's new, new dynamics. Now, robust and adaptive control deal with disturbance or unknown finitely many parameters, importantly, they generally assume that the original target remains reachable. And like we showed, that's just not the case sometimes. So let me give on, uh, on both an example of uh, this happening. Again, no one died. <laughs> and if you're wondering how no one died there, those were RC airplanes. Uh, but so, so the airplane that was hit, certainly its dynamics were way off. Certainly at, at that point, it couldn't just try to continue to its original happy location, right? At that point, it wants to figure out where it can land, if it can land safely, what it can do. So what we are interested in is this. After a change in dynamics, the system can almost certainly no longer use the same control law to reach the target. In fact, the target might not be reachable using any control law. We're interested in what the system is certifiably capable of reaching. Of course, the, the answer to if, if, if you know nothing, you can assure nothing, right? If the dynamics can be anything, then yeah, anything can happen. However, if you do have some set of possible dynamics, whatever it is, however large or small or finite or infinite it is, you can try to compute the reachable set for each of those dynamics. You can try to intersect all of those sets. And what you get is certainly reachable by all of these dynamics. It doesn't say how it's reachable, but it certainly is reachable by all of these dynamics. Now, easier said than done, of course. I'm, I'm uh, trying to intersect infinitely many reachable sets of a nonlinear system. That's. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised PowerPoint didn't complain when I wrote this. So in theory, sure, I define this well. In practice, how do I compute this? And so the, our idea is I will try to figure out what velocities the system can progress in at a particular time. 
So let's say that after a short amount of learning, I can figure out, hey, my local dynamics right now are this, just here. And if I have some sort of a Lipschitz bound or some other bound on how quickly these dynamics change, then at least for a short time, I will be able to say something about what is guaranteed to be reachable. So now I try to, again, do something pretty hard, which is intersect infinitely many of these guarantee or of these velocity sets. Now, velocities that are guaranteed at time t are, and, and of course, this is not the only way to approach it, but velocities that are guaranteed at time t are the velocities that are available at time zero modulo in some way maximum wildness of the system. What I mean by this maximum wildness is some sort of a Lipschitz bound on the change in dynamics. And I can often get that from physical knowledge, from, from design uh, uh, parameters. I, I, could, I have a shot at getting that. I can also figure out the local dynamics by doing learning in an arbitrarily short time which ideally I, I can do, it's, uh, it's the learning part of what's called myopic control that we used to work at. So for control affine systems, it turns out that if I know these dynamics at time zero and I know a Lipschitz bound, the guaranteed velocity set is an intersection of a bunch of sets, which are all the same. They're in, so there's infinitely many, but uh, they're translated, dilated, uh, rotated copies of more or less the same object. And so in, in our case, the, that object is an ellipse. So how do I compute that? Well, an initial idea is, so an intersection of infinitely many ellipses is sadly not an ellipse. And it's hard to geometrically determine, but you can try fitting a maximal ball in there, and at least you will get an under approximation of some sort. Hopefully it will be good, maybe not, depending on how kind of elongated this object is. We can do better than that. We can try to fit a more complicated object. Uh, this, this is something that uh, my students submitted recently. We can try to fit an ellipse in there. We can try to fit a polygon of some sort in there. So still some sort of a geometrically simple object. And we can get these reachable set under approximation. So in this case, if, uh, so, so the system's true reachable set is blue. Of course, we can't compute this true reachable set because we don't know the true dynamics of the system. We only know very little of those. We know them locally at time zero, and we know the, uh, the Lipschitz bound of them. So our red and green approximations are under approximations of this reachable set obtained from these guaranteed velocity sets. The red one is obtained from kind of naive maximal ball thing. The, the, the green one is obtained from uh, the velocities that are polygonal. So you can see that it kind of looks like, a, like an oval polygon. And so we did that on a bunch of examples. We did it on an example of a, of a quadcopter. And of course, as time progresses, these uh, as time progresses, these uh, these approximations become worse. But at least over short time, we can say something. Okay. So now, hopefully, I sold you, or tried to sell you on, on these three stories. Um, I claim that I'm not about to retire. Uh, that uh, there's still that there's still a lot of work to be done. Uh, first of all, there's a lot of technical assumptions that I kind of lied to you about here that I didn't mention. For instance, uh, loss of control authority. Yeah, we only do things with linear systems. Uh, for unknown dynamics, we kind of need the full actuation or foolish actuation, things like that. Importantly, we can be smarter. For instance, for unknown systems, I might not just know the Lipschitz bound on the change in dynamics. I might know that some actuators simply do not affect some of the systems. So if it's a linear system, I know, I know that some things are zero. That should be somehow useful. That should give me a better bound on the, on the reachable set. I'm also interested in not only what can be reached, how do I reach it? And this is something that we're trying to do to merge kind of this guaranteed reachability with robust or, or myopic control. Finally, we're interested in not just in reachability, we're interested in, hey, can I reach something without dying first? So this, these are kind of reach, reach avoid tasks. There's many other things as, as you move towards uh, implementation. There's 
computational limitations for these things. There's time delays in uh, receiving information from sensors or actuators. There's partial observability. Our medium term goals are, we want to combine a lot of these scenarios. Uh, partly we did that, uh, we have something about actuator degradation with disturbances. We want to, for instance, talk about partially unknown dynamics with partial loss of control, things like that. We want to talk about end-to-end -end planning, learning, and control. So first, I want to figure out what task can be provably completed. Second, I need to figure out what I need to learn about the dynamics in order to complete this task that is provably completable. And third, I want to complete this task. I want to have an assured control law. I want to have more physics-based and design-based results. So exploitation of significant unchanged prior knowledge for better estimation. Long term, we, we want to validate this stuff on, on real systems. So we want to use sensors and perception to recognize fault type. So far, we just said, oh yeah, I know that I don't have control over this actuator anymore. How do we know that? So we want to use fault detection, sensor fusion, and, and state estimation. We want to deal with complex missions in high fidelity simulations. So not just linear reachability missions, but missions in hybrid systems, missions where there's multiple objectives or a sequence of objectives. And that goes through automata and hybrid systems. And that's something that's of course of, of a lot of interest in, uh, in urban air mobility and overall unmanned air, air mobility, particularly for the Department of Defense. Finally, we want to put this thing on actual hardware. We want to implement it on board. And in order to do that, we need to talk about real-time computations. We need to talk about time-delayed control. There's a lot of applications. Uh, we've done some work with our uh, small quadcopter that, uh, that we have in our lab. Uh, we're currently engaged with NASA on their supposedly high-fidelity simulation of a uh, lander on a, on a moon of Jupiter, that's a big robotic arm that, uh, that moves and that needs to stay resilient for as long as possible or provide some sort of useful, uh, some sort of useful information and useful sampling for as long as possible. Uh, we're also doing uh, some stuff with the, with the Robo Simeon with Chris Hauser from, from UIUC. And finally, on, on a topic that's far away from robotics or aerospace, we're also interested in resilience of power networks. When uh, there's an adversarial cyber actor or some sort of a disaster that puts some of your power sources, some of the parts of your power network out of commission, what can we do about that? Can we ensure that the system still retains its capability to complete the objective and provide service? The point is, I claim that dealing with abrupt mid-mission events is crucial for autonomy in challenging environments. I also claim that while classic robustness and adaptation are amazing, they are not enough. We need task assignment and we need assured resilience. Our current results have taken a step in that direction. We are able to compute reachable sets with unknown dynamics, with actuator degradation, with partial loss of control. There's still a lot more to be done. I'm interested in autonomous task assignment, so actually figuring out how the person figured out that the highway or the frontage road is the actual best thing to land at. How to perform real-time learning, so updating of this knowledge of the dynamics and control for complex missions in challenging environments. Um, I should acknowledge NASA, NASA, and NASA, I forgot to put them the third time. Um, and uh, also our, uh, our work with uh, AF Works from uh, so the Department of Air Force and the Discovery Partners Institute. And, and of course, my students who are among others who are kind of taking the lead on this uh, with actuator degradation is Hamza El Kabir. With partial loss of control, it's JB Bouvier. And our um, amazing undergrad student who now went to MIT, Kathleen Shu, and her new advisor, Chuchu Fan and Taha Shafa, who is doing work on unknown dynamics. Thank you so much. I'm sorry for the mess up with the PowerPoints. Who knew there's multiple versions of PowerPoint?
asked about the, the big leap mm -hmm. from operations control. Yeah, to yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, there was enormous trajectory of speed. Yeah. At each moment in time. Yes. Uh, and you compared excess time speed with yeah. excellent time speed. Yeah. Then went to this game theoretical game yeah. for adversarial mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you looked at time to consume. Mm -hmm. So in one case, you're looking at a desired trajectory to speed. Mm -hmm. And in the other case, Mm -hmm. And I don't understand how to put that into a understanding. Yeah, so so I don't I don't think that betrays any deep failure of what we're of, of what I was talking about. I, I think that's actually a, a you know, very clear challenge as to what we're doing because uh, the the part on the so 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 the part on the actuator loss or degradation of actuator capabilities relies heavily on the fact that I can still control all parts equally at every time, that, that the machine doesn't change, that this is a one-time event that happened at the beginning, and now I'm just whatever doing, but it's not a continuous degradation. In the, in the loss of actuation capabilities, that's a much harder thing because I am losing this, uh, these capabilities over time, or, or the adversary can do different things over time. And I, and I think it's a big challenge to try to kind of combine these two. What my guesstimate on how one could try combining them, and for all the, uh, all the hundreds of members of the media in this room, please don't quote me on this. Uh, what, I would, uh, what I would try to get at is, Try to um, put in this notion of change dynamics or changing dynamics or loss of actuator uh, capabilities into the Bihari inequality, getting a worse inequality essentially, but putting in this notion that, hey, things might change over time to give myself a worse bound and then try to, to combine it in that way. I'm not promising anything. Does that does that answer? Yes, thank, thank you. you. Yes, please. Uh, is it the first example or the third example? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Absolutely. So uh, long-term, all bets are off. Uh, because if you have no long-term knowledge, so the only knowledge I used right now is, hey, I know something about the dynamics right now, and this big bound on what's going to happen over time. And of course, as time progresses, I'm going to get worse and worse. The idea behind this is that I will use this, uh, this work to provide myself short-term guarantees and to say, hey, there is a way for you to not die in the next two seconds and perform a particular maneuver. In those two seconds, I will be able to learn something, whether actively or not, I'll be able to collect some information. Then I will have a better idea of what I'm working with. And maybe next time my bound won't be just two seconds. Maybe I'll be able to say, hey, for the next five seconds, you're capable of doing something. So this is something that we're really interested in, that kind of this, this, uh, this framework needs to be combined with online learning. It shouldn't be a one-time thing because one-time thing will only give you short-time guarantees. Great question, thank you. Uh, in some sense. None, none, so, so the bar is very low right now. Uh, so right now, what we are assuming in general, we, we have some, you know, we're playing some little, little toy examples where there's more things, but right now we assume that I know the system state entirely, perfectly, immediately. That I am able to plug in any control entirely perfectly immediately and that I'm able to see 
any adversary's input immediately, perfectly, entirely. Um, that's obviously not going to be true. So the first thing that you might want to consider before talking about you know, the, the technical aspects of what sensors I'm using and things like that is just try to develop the, the theoretical framework of, hey, I'm not able to see X at T. I'm perhaps only able to see the kind of standard story of Y of T, which is some function of X of T. Or I am able to see this is something that my student is working on right now. Instead of uh, being able to see the adversary V of T at every time T, I'm only able to see V of T minus tau for some tau. What can I say about my guaranteed resilience then? And once we have a grip on that, then we can, I think, start talking about specific you know, perception capabilities and, and all of that, which is, I agree, a really interesting problem. I just don't think that we're there yet. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's my method. I love it. Uh, so uh, the, method, the method that I'm trying to pitch here is really easy. And, and of course, it only works in kind of an idealized system, which or, or so far we've developed it in an idealized system that forgets about all of these other issues that I just raised in answering the previous question, which is this. You can figure out your local dynamics in an arbitrarily short amount of time uh, by plugging in uh, different controls. And uh, so, so plugging in different test controls, seeing how the system responds. And if you can do that in an arbitrarily short amount of time and you have perfect resolution on how quickly you can change these test controls and so on, you can get a uh, model of your local dynamics, so just what's happening right now, with an arbitrarily small error. Um, then, of course, you would have to kind of try to keep doing that forever or, or start using some sort of a more more standard system identification methods and so on. But that's that's the story. We, we call it myopic control. It's great. You should give it a shot. Mm-hmm. Even, even in this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I, I think that's a very good question. It's a uh, certainly something that's of interest to, uh, to 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 the learning community altogether, and it comes down to what uh, what the community calls, I guess, the uh, exploration versus exploitation, where this exploitation story is, hey, I know very little, but I know something, so let me just stick with what I know. And the exploration is, hey, let me just try learning for the sake of learning and hope that it gets me somewhere better. Um, ultimately, what, uh, what you can do, with, and it's kind of two extremes. One extreme is you say, hey, I'm not going to actively learn at all. I'm going to stay within what is guaranteed. That will already enable me to collect some information. I'm not really choosing what information to collect. I'm not trying to figure things out, but I will get more data and hopefully this data will be helpful. The other option is to say, okay, uh, let's try to develop a and this is, you know, again, very high level, very difficult technically. Let's try to develop some sort of a probabilistic uh, interpretation of this. Let's say, hey, uh, this thing is guaranteed with 100% that I can get these, uh, that I can get these velocities. If I'm not happy with any of these velocities, maybe I can have a somewhat bigger set that I can still get to with 99%. 
am I willing to pay the price of 1% in order to get a lot more data? And that comes down to uncertainty quantification. How do I know what action, performing which action will provide me with what data and with the quality of what data? And that's something that I haven't mentioned at all that we're very interested in is trying to figure out what are the most useful actions to figure out the system dynamics. Well, ideally staying safe. That's, that's the big story. It's, it's a massive question. It's an amazing question. It's also like 200 PhD theses worth. Thank you all.